Okay, it looks like it's noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us um, for our webinar today. This is the Framework for Strategic Response to Invasive Phragmites australis in Minnesota. Um, just going through a couple of housekeeping items and then we will introduce the speakers and panelists for today. Um, first, I'm Megan Weber. I am an Extension Educator here at University of Minnesota Extension and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. Um, and we, let's see, we're gonna have about 30 minutes of presenting time and then the rest will remain for Q&A. So if you have questions during the webinar, go ahead and start typing them into the chat and um, I'll be keeping my eye on that and we'll start pulling from the questions in the chat at the end. So if there's more questions than we have time to answer, um, the MinFreg team has generously offered to type up responses and we will get those back out to you um, later, probably not today, but, um, but soon there will be answers available for you for any, any remaining questions that we couldn't get to. If you have some technical problems, um, you can email Pat Mulcahy. Um, his email address is showing on the screen right now, but in case visual seems to be a problem, it's mulcahyp at umn.edu, um, and he'll be able to help you out. Um, the last final bit, so we're going to have the camera turned off during the presentation, and then it will turn on during the panel part, so you can kind of chat with us, except all of your chat comes via the webinar chat. Um, you can adjust your view. You'll see um, there'll be like a little video that shows in the upper corner. So you can um, adjust that and kind of pick if you want to see more of the video and less of the webinar. You can just kind of play around with the buttons and, and pick the view that suits your needs best. Um, I think that's it for the logistics. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over so that our speakers and panelists can introduce themselves quick. It's not advancing. I think you have to click on that. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Dan Larkin. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist here at the University of Minnesota. Hi, everybody. I'm Chelsea Blanke. Um, I've been working with the Phragmites team here at the U um, since October um, on the response assessment and kind of have a background in aquatic plant management and invasive species response. And I'm Julia Bonin. I'm a researcher on the MinFrag project. I was responsible for coordinating the effort to document invasive phragmites around the state, um, doing that by con conducting targeted searches, as well as recruiting citizens and staff, agency staff to help us as reporters. Great. So I'll start off giving a brief overview of invasive phragmites and a synopsis of our research to date in Minnesota, and then turn it over to Chelsea, who will present on the strategic response framework we've developed. And then, as Megan mentioned, we'll end with about a half hour Q&A with the three of us. So our topic today is Phragmites australis, or common reed. It's a tall, perennial, cool season wetland grass with a global distribution. It's found on every continent except Antarctica around the world. And what's been documented is this phenomenon in Phragmites of a cryptic invasion. And by that, I mean invasion by non-native genotypes or lineages of what is also in North America, a native species. And this was shown by Kristen Saltonstall in a seminal paper in the early 2000s. She used genetic sequencing of modern Phragmites samples from around the world, as well as herbarium samples from North America that are, allowed her to go further back in time. And what she showed is this large scale change in genetic structure across the continent. So based on herbarium samples before 1910, there was these, just these little pockets on the Northeast Atlantic coast of a European lineage of Phragmites. And then after 1960, that had spread westward um, across the U.S., and now it's broadly distributed throughout the United States, the lower 48. 
And that change to date has been greatest where it began in the Northeast. So here, if you look at Southern New England, we have the native subspecies of Phragmites shown with a green symbol, and then the European lineage with the red symbol. And you can see over time, there's been this um, spread of Phragmites inland as the European lineage gained ground and a loss of the native subspecies. And again, this is the area where European Phragmites first arrived. It's able to spread by a variety of means. Like many aquatic plants, it's really good at clonal or asexual reproduction. So all sorts of fragments above and below ground can lead to new plants. In addition, it can spread through sexual reproduction by seeds. And for this is important because for a long time it was thought that spread by seed was insignificant, but over the past 10 years, genetic research has shown that seed is in fact a major driver of spread. And so our understanding of spread risk has really grown tremendously in the last 10 plus years. And we now see that um, many new populations are arriving, arising through seed dispersal. Factors associated with spread of Phragmites in general are sort of all the disturbances we're imposing upon the landscape. So roads and ditches, increased nutrients, altered hydrology, a whole variety of disturbances. This is a, a very opportunistic lineage of Phragmites that is able to thrive under these disturbed conditions. And then for seed production in particular, it's been documented that as there's greater genetic diversity of Phragmites, there's production of more viable seed. In addition, increased nutrient availability, particularly of nitrogen, is associated with increased seed production. So the invasiveness of Phragmites depends on environmental conditions, site fertility, disturbance, as well as genetic diversity. So here we've showing this um, sort of cartoon from McCormick et al. And we start here with this green wetland complex. And there are a few devegetated or disturbed patches. And this is a system with lower nutrients. And so likely to have fewer colonization events in a relatively intact wetland like this. And so there's less accumulation of genetic diversity. Seed production stays relatively low. In contrast, in a more disturbed system, one with higher nutrients, there are more openings for European Phragmites to colonize. And then with that, there's a greater accumulation of genetic diversity and more production of viable seed. And so it sets up this positive feedback where um, the greater opportunities for Phragmites lead to greater genetic diversity, which leads to greater spread potential. So why do we care? What are the effects of invasive Phragmites? Despite the fact that it's the same species as our native Phragmites, it's a different subspecies and it's quite different ecologically. It's notably faster growing, taller, denser, and produces more biomass. In research I was involved in, in the Chicago area, for example, we did comparisons of non-native and native Phragmites growing in similar habitats, and we found that the non-native Phragmites on average was 25% taller, had 50% higher stem density, and had six-fold higher cover. Um, here we have a, a photo from Minnesota of a really robust invasive Phragmites stand, and you can imagine a plant that grows that tall can really alter its environment, and so Phragmites is um, an ecosystem engineer that can really change a lot of attributes of a habitat. It can be a problem in part because it's able to form such large, nearly monotypic stands as it spreads in a wetland complex. And with that spread, it's been documented to lower plant diversity and displace native Phragmites, which is going to be trying to occupy similar habitats. And then this has um, further effects both for humans, so it can interfere with water access or drainage, as well as on animals and wildlife. So it can have impacts to invertebrates, to fish habitat, to 
use of wetlands by wetland birds and can fundamentally alter the structure and function of food webs. We started our research in Minnesota in summer 2017 and have been focused on documenting distribution of invasive Phragmites in the state, evaluating spread risk by looking at seed production and viability and genetic diversity, and then working to develop uh, response options and strategies. And that's part of our um, goal with this webinar today. So briefly, we use a hybrid approach to identify distribution in Minnesota. We use crowdsourcing, so probably a number of you on this webinar we contacted asking you to look for populations of potential non-native Phragmites. Julia also did a lot of her own targeted search effort, particularly in areas of the states of the state that were sort of undersampled by our reporters. And then we also checked records that were already in EDMAPS, which is a website for reporting invasive species. We developed an identification guide using really nice photos that Julia took of Phragmites specimens from Minnesota. And then samples were sent to us that we identified using morphological features and then also with partners at Chicago Botanic Garden used genetic testing as sort of the gold standard to confirm our identifications. So what did we found? We found that this crowdsourcing approach was really effective. Participant identifications using our identification guide were 95% accurate relative to genetic testing. And this is the first of our uh, plug of our website, www.minfrag.org, where you can look at this identification guide and download it as a PDF. And to date, we found nearly 400 populations statewide across 39 counties, shown here uh, with these the red symbols. And if you go to the website, you can also look at distribution of native Phragmites and other information that we have on there about these populations. So where is invasive Phragmites found? Um, in a real diversity of habitats. Um, our highest proportion of habitats for Phragmites were lake shores, followed by roadsides, wetlands, and other habitat types. And unsurprisingly, given this diversity of habitat types, there is a real diversity of land ownership of where these populations were found. So a lot of private lands, agency lands, MnDOT, roadways, municipal, etc. And we found that many of our um, many of the patches, most in fact, are quite small. So about 90% of the populations we identified are less than a quarter acre. So that's just good news. So while we have close to 400 populations, most of them are quite small. And in fact, only um, a handful, about six populations are an acre or more in size. So that's encouraging in terms of potential to um, respond effectively. I won't go into detail about seed production um, at this point, but we've investigated risk of spread driven by production of viable seed. There had been hope that maybe in Minnesota's climate, um, the growing season might be too short for seed to widely mature. Um, however, we have found seed set um, production of viable seed in many populations throughout the state. But we're not seeing seed set yet in all of these populations. And as I mentioned, most of the populations are quite small. And so this is why we argue that there is a window of opportunity for coordinated strategic response. We want to manage early invasions in sipping populations as on the left, where there's a potential to have effective control with low non-target impacts versus 
in in other states to our west and to our east where they have re they've gotten really extensive infestations like along the Platte River in Nebraska and they've had to resort to really large scale control efforts. Now I'll turn it over to Chelsea who will present on the her assessment that she led to support response efforts. Okay, and I think we're just going to do a quick change of slides really quick. Um, so I'll hold off until we have that. As a reminder, if anyone had any questions that have come up as Dan was speaking, please start typing those into the chat panel and we'll be saving those so that we can start answering those questions once everyone is wrapped up. Um, all right, and I can just go ahead and get started then um, as we're pulling this up. So, um, so the MinFrag team went through all this effort to determine invasive Phragmites distribution and see viability in the state. And given its relatively uh, limited coverage in the state, it became apparent that we seem to be right in this window of opportunity to reverse invasive Phragmites spread in Minnesota. Um, oh, sorry, I can't advance, I guess. Thanks, Matt. Um, so invasive pra species practitioners know that management is most effective in the early stages of invasion when in the invasive is not yet widely abundant and distributed across the landscape. Um, given the imperative of, of catching invasive phragmites early, uh, we really wanted to help position partners for an effective response. So uh, looking at this commonly used figure, we're somewhere between scattered and numerous locations and intense effort is needed now if we want to reverse invasive phragmites spread. Um, that's what lead up, led us to develop uh, an assessment of needs and possible strategies for implementing a landscape scale response to invasive phragmites in Minnesota. And if you haven't seen it already, you can access the assessment on our website at www.minfrag.org. Um, you'll see that the assessment takes a regional approach to characterizing the status of invasive phragmites and potential capacity and needs for response. Um, for each of 12 regions, we've described the distribution, capacity, and possible response options. Um, this map here shows the 12 regions we identified largely based on the distribution of verified populations, uh, county boundaries, active phragmites control efforts that we are aware of, uh, tribal boundaries, and the presence of cooperative weed management areas and other entities with an interest in invasive plant management. Um, participants in invasive phragmites response may choose to operate within these regions or change the boundaries. It's certainly not meant to be restrictive in any way, only to aid efforts. Um, the assessment was written with regional and local organizations in mind, thinking that maybe the level, the level that can mobilize and implement control and monitoring uh, efforts most readily, but of course we feel that participation by state and federal partners will be integral to a successful response as well, and I'll get into that more in a bit. Uh, before I go any further, I want to make sure to address like what do we mean by invasive species response. Um, we're using the word response to represent any surveillance, outreach, coordination, monitoring, or control conducted with the goal of preventing, stopping, or reversing the spread of an invasive species. In this case, invasive phragmites. I just wanted to make that clear as it's a word individuals who work on invasive species might be familiar with that may not otherwise seem very meaningful. Um, so now that I've introduced the document and you know where to find it, for the rest of the presentation, I wanna highlight what we've identified as some key components for an effective coordinated response to invasive phragmites at the landscape scale in Minnesota. I wanna start by zooming in to discuss methods for controlling invasive phragmites. Implementation of effective control approaches is one of those critical components for responding to the species. Um, a literature review of invasive phragmites control approaches was conducted as part of the MinFrag project by Anna Peschel. Um, the results of her work uh, suggest end of summer herbicide treatment is the most effective and practical approach for controlling invasive phragmites. Uh, the most effective herbicides are broad spectrum herbicides, glyphosate or mazapir, which are also used in combination. Um, so looking at this graph uh, from Anna's results, comparing fall herbicide treatment to other management approaches, you can see that 
percent control of invasive phragmites for fall herbicide treatment resulted in higher percent control on average and was more consistent in resulting in higher percent control than other management approaches. Uh, the end number at the bottom of each plot signifies the number of studies evaluating each uh, approach. And at this point, we think most populations are of the size and site conditions that they could be treated using um, a UTV, a boat, or other vehicle mounted with a tank of core herbicide or with backpack sprayers. Um, and while mowing alone is not effective for controlling invasive phragmites, a winter or summer mow to reduce standing dead stems can facilitate the uptake of herbicide. Uh, looking at a similarly organized box plot here from Anna's work, we see that fall herbicide combination uh, combined with mowing or some other biomass removal resulted in consistently higher percent control than um, other management approaches. So we're recommending a combined approach of herbicide treatment followed by mowing. It should be expected that this control schedule will need to be repeated for a few years to eliminate um, invasive phragmites stands. And here on this timeline, uh, we have that late August through September herbicide treatment period and mowing when the ground is frozen before there are nesting birds out and about. Um, I just want to point out too that Julia here is a great resource for questions about control methods and she knows a lot about this type of management and the individual populations out in the landscape as well. Um, so keep that in mind as we're, if you have any questions about management approaches. Um, so now we've kind of discussed the fundamentals of how to control invasive phragmites. We want to emphasize how important it is that control is implemented properly and responsibly. Um, contractors and other individuals conducting invasive phragmites control will need to be thorough and provide adequate follow-up and monitoring. And those con coordinating control may need to help uh, hold them accountable and assure, ensure sufficient quality of that work. Um, part of this involves decontamination of any equipment used in control projects. We know that construction equipment, mowers, and other vehicles can contribute to invasive phragmites spread. Um, if a piece of equipment can't be sufficiently decontaminated, some alternative method should be employed. Uh, I mentioned we'll need folks to coordinate these efforts, but the partners who will take this on have yet to be identified. At a minimum, what would be needed is individuals who can work with contractors and oversee control and follow-up, uh, manage necessary permits and agreements, work with private landowners to gain property access where necessary, and develop surveillance and outreach strategies. Um, we strongly encourage anyone using our assessment to inform response efforts to read and understand the methods section in the appendices. Um, it's important that partners understand how population sizes, property ownerships, and response options were determined so they can be evaluated and adjusted as needed. Um, so, you know, we uh, as the university cannot identify exactly who will be doing this work, um, but our assessment provides some possible structures for coordinating a landscape level response to invasive phragmites. Um, and so we present a few different options and we ultimately think that the effort would best be supported by partners at the state to local levels. One option for a state agency such as, uh, one option would be for the for state agencies such as the Department of Natural Resources or Department of Agriculture to administer a grant program from which other partners could apply for funding or for those agencies to coordinate control directly. Another option would be for non-state organizations to fund their own control efforts or apply for funding from various sources. Um, and there, of course, could also be some combination of these approaches. Um, regardless of the structure for coordination, though, it would be extremely helpful for there to be a central entity to help coordinate and assist across the landscape and to fill geographic gaps and monitor progress. That would help um, make sure efforts are more comprehensive. Um, our assessment describes many different potential funding sources that could support the kind of response to invasive fragments we're talking about. Um, such as LCCMR funding, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, MDA's Not Just Sweet Grant Program, and others. Um, aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Aid funding could also be used for invasive phragmites control in some areas of the state. 
Um, our assessment estimates cost of herbicide treatment and mowing for three years on all of verified invasive Phragmites populations. These estimates range from roughly 800,000 to 2.2 million. Spending at this level would be comparable to efforts in other states. Um, Wisconsin, for example, regulates invasive Phragmites as a prohibited species in its western half and has been uh, systematically controlling populations there. Over the past seven years or so, the Wisconsin DNR has spent roughly 700,000 on herbicide treatments to contain invasive Phragmites from expanding into western Wisconsin and an additional 1.6 million for treatments along the Lake Michigan coastline. And in Nebraska, regional uh, weed management areas have implemented invasive Phragmites control effort, efforts along the Platte River. Um, with approximately 5.4 million spent on herbicide application and mechanical control over the past 10 years. Um, this Nebraska work covered approximately 43,000 acres in comparison to the estimated 50 acres uh, estimated in Minnesota. Uh, and also the Maryland DNR. These are just some examples of um, costs for control efforts we got in other states. So um, the Maryland DNR shared that they've been act actively managing invasive phragmites for 25 years with annual spending up to $170,000. Um, so the estimated costs for herbicide treatment and mowing are comparable to spending in other states, but the difference here in Minnesota is that we're at this critical juncture where sufficient investment in control now could result in only small expenditures for responding to newly detected populations in the future. I also just want to quickly highlight that while the cost estimates provided in the assessment provide reasonable approximations for herbicide treatment and site preparation costs, um, they also carry assumptions that may not reflect exactly how responses are ultimately implemented. So um, we encourage, again, that um, you read those methods sections if you are going to be using the assessment to plan response efforts. and. Um, also to engage contractors early for quotes specific to the populations being targeted in order to avoid lack of funding. Um, we also identified some core competencies um, for individuals participating in invasive phragmites response. Um, these include the ability to identify and report invasive phragmites, comply with permitting and herbicide use requirements, decontaminate equipment, and evaluate and report results. And I'll kind of break these down a little bit more. Um, Dan already mentioned the MinFrag ID guide available on our website, and Julia has also been and will continue to accept samples for verification. Um, populations can be reported uh, on the EdMaps website, and um, populations really should be confirmed as non native by an expert or uh, through genetic testing prior to implementing control in order to avoid destruction of native Phragmites. Managers will need to be able to determine the appropriate control approach and equipment needs for a given site, acquire permits from the DNR, and use aquatic approved herbicide for works, work at wet sites. Um, this is very important as some herbicide formulations are extremely toxic to aquatic organisms. So anyone conducting herbicide treatments should be trained in appropriate pesticide use or um, anyone hired to conduct treatments must hold proper uh, commercial pesticide applicator license. Reporting and evaluation of control work will also be very important. This will help to determine if control is effective and support adaptive management where needed. There's an online tool called ISM Track that is integrated with EdMaps. Um, it's still in development, but it promises to be a great way to track control activities. And the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative is another great resource for management information and supporting adaptive management. Finally, once invasive Phragmites has been eliminated from a location, revegetation and restora restoration efforts may be needed at some sites. Um, if, a native, if native vege vegetation does not return to the site, revegetation can help prevent uh, reinvasion, stabilize soils, and assist in the recovery of native plants and wildlife habitat. So I'm just going to shift gears a little bit now. Um, we've discussed what an effective coordinated response to wild invasive Phragmites populations might look like. But invasive Phragmites is also used in some wastewater treatment facilities in Minnesota, and these operations are likely sources of spread. 
Um, there's 17 wastewater treatment facilities in Minnesota that use or have used invasive phragmites in their operations. Um, invasive phragmites is used for dewatering biosolids, which are um, residual organic materials that remain following sewage treatment. Um, the biosolids sol and invasive phragmites are contained in a reed bed like this one, where invasive phragmites removes water through evapotranspiration. This consolidates the solids, which then reduces volume and allows the facilities to remove biosolids less often, uh, thereby reducing costs. So um, invasive phragmites at wastewater treatment facilities is an issue that must be addressed um, at the state level. Um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency regulates wastewater treatment operations, and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has issued permits for transporting material for disposal or reuse. Um, it's really important that solutions uh, reduce the potential for invasive phragmites spread while supporting sound wastewater treatment operations. Given the relatively limited distribution of invasive phragmites in the state, facilities would ideally shift to an alternative sooner than later. Um, invasive phragmites at, um, in reed beds at three northern Wisconsin facilities was recently replaced with native phragmites. Um, alternatives to the use of invasive phragmites in Minnesota could include transitioning to the use of alternative plant species or possibly, possibly following that example of those three Wisconsin facilities or employing other engineering methods. Um, however, there are uncertainties associated with the effectiveness of alternatives and potentially high costs associated with some of those other um, non-plant uh, methods. So pilot projects are really needed right at this point that test the efficacy of alternative plant species and practices for containment, um, surveillance and control of escapes needs to be developed. Um, reed bed structures have an expected lifespan of at least 20 years and biosolids and plant removal are removed every four to 10 years. So these timelines could provide opportunities to transition to an alternative dewatering approach. And state agencies could assist with guiding policy and identifying funding to support eventual transitions. Now I just wanna take a moment to highlight various agencies and other groups we think will be key to this effort. First, we already talked about the DNR a bit. They will, at a minimum, need to be involved in processing permits and providing technical assistance. They could provide bulk permits to allow control at multiple sites, and the DNR could potentially assist with control coordination and administering grant funding. Um, because many invasive phragmites populations are found along state and federal highways, the Minnesota Department of Transportation could assist by integrating control of invasive phragmites with other roadside management efforts, or alternatively, they could allow access to the roadsides they maintain to allow those efforts to occur. Um, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture is responsible for the state's noxious weed law, which, uh, under which invasive phragmites is regulated as a restricted noxious weed. Um, this regulatory status prohibits importation, sale, and transportation of propagating parts. The Noxious Weed Advisory Committee, which is led by MDA, develops risk assessments and recommends changes in status to the MDA, MDA commissioner. Um, so integration of recent research into the risk assessment for invasive phragmites may lead the committee to recommend prohibited status. Prohibited regulatory classification requires that uh, effort be made to prevent maturation and disposal, disposal of propagating parts or elimination of the plants altogether. Um, MDA also works with county agriculture inspectors in every county who could aid in response efforts and prohibited status would ensure cooperation with landowners. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, as we discussed, regulates wastewater treatment operations. Uh, they could assist with communicating with facilities operators and identifying potential funding sources for transitioning to alternative dewatering practices. Um, we've been communicating with DNR staff and other state agencies throughout our research, and the agencies are starting to work together on this issue. Um, now it's really important that additional partners are engaged. Um, there are many groups who could potentially uh, contribute or should be involved in this effort, such as tribes, federal partners, counties, soil, um, soil and water conservation districts, cooperative weed, cooperative weed, weed management areas, 
county agriculture inspectors, et cetera. Um, and support from all, all of these levels will really be critical because invasive pregmites is a shared problem. So all that said, just to summar up, summarize, um, MinFrag's research has really increased knowledge of invasive pragmatis in Minnesota and suggests that there's an opportunity to reverse the spread if a strategic concerted response is mounted now. Um, we hope that our assessment will support such an effort and the effectiveness of such an effort will uh, hinge upon partner engagement, sound and thorough control implementation and sufficient funding and policy and we know that this is an amb ambitious undertaking that will come with many challenges, but we feel they could be overcome to yield significant benefits for the state. Um, last, I just want to thank Mazurk for funding this project via the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Our partners who assisted with reviewing our assessment and providing information regarding invasive pregmites at wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, folks who provided co uh, control cost information and the many individuals who've uh, continue to uh, scout for invasive Phragmites populations throughout the state. And it looks like I learned a little bit over time, but thank you, and we're looking forward to your questions. Okay, so as a reminder, you can go ahead and use that chat feature if you have any questions that have come up to you during the webinar. Um, it looks like we do already have um, a pretty good list of questions, so I'm going to start working through those now, um, the first couple of questions that I see um, relate a little bit more to the biology of Phragmites. So one of the first questions says, many asters and other weeds such as garlic mustard are able to continue developing mature viable seed after cutting and herbicide treatment. Is this something that non-native Phragmites is also capable of doing? I don't know if there's any research to that effect, but it's possible that it could do that as long as um, some of the stems remain green and don't dry down very quickly. Um, they seem to develop their seed over a short period of time in late fall from mid-September to mid-October. So I think that's a possibility, um, but we don't know that for sure. That's also a potential risk of treating with herbicide too early in the season if you knock the plant back, but give it plenty of time to rebound and recover and, um, you know, have mature seed by the end of the season. Great. And then kind of along that same question line, um, do you know if apparently dead stems, for example, those that might have been cut in the winter, um, start to, can they grow back now that it's spring? No, dead stems will not be able to regrow once they're, they've died over the winter. They don't have any capacity to, to grow shoots or roots or shoots. Great. Um, so then there's a couple questions about um, Pragmites control. So one of the first ones um, was wondering about how you balance the need to use chemicals um, versus reported concerns about some of their impacts on human health. Well, there aren't any mechanical ways that are effective at controlling it right now. So what we propose is that if you use the optimal treatment times that are recommended of fall treatment, then you can minimize those impacts by having to apply chemicals less frequently. So one application at the appropriate time should be effective to knock the plant back or kill it. And then you would do the follow-up treatment the following year at the appropriate time again. And thereby minimize your impacts or your inputs of chemicals to the environment. Yeah, and that's also why we think it's really critical to identify populations early and respond quickly because then and be dealing with those majority of populations that we've identified that are less than 500 square foot. So the, the raw amount of chemicals being put on the landscape will be lower, and there's also greater probability of success, successful control. And so, you know, we would like to see minimal use of herbicide, um, and we think that's best served by rapid response in other places that have had invasive Phragmites 
longer they're they have much larger populations, you know, acres and acres. And so that's when you're using herbicide at a really large scale and are going to have more potential for non-target impacts as well as lower efficacy. And then it's also critical to um, account for aquatic environments in terms of making sure that um, uh, formulations that are safe for use in aquatic environments are used. Great. Um, so then along the lines of um, prevention, do you have information about how um, equipment should be decontaminated that's used in Pragmite stands? Uh, well, first of all, some equipment, if you don't have any means to appropriately clean your equipment, then you probably shouldn't take it into a stand. But there are definitely protocols, um, for example, the DNR has their Operational Order 113 that describes how equipment should be cleaned and handled going in and out of sites that are contaminated with invasive species. Um, anybody can pull up that document and um, use it and apply it themselves. So you could be a commercial applicator and you can use those protocols. Um, but again, if you don't, if you have equipment that is likely to pick up seed and you should perhaps just reassess how you are going to approach managing that population if you don't have a means of decontaminating your equipment. Yeah, and while mowing, as Chelsea described, provides added benefits, it's not necessarily worth those benefits in certain situations or with certain equipment where you're adding to spread risk. Great. Um, so when thinking about control, um, what to you constitutes control? Is there a level of control that's established after, for example, three years of treatment and follow-up observation? Well, I like to think that after three years of control, you would be just doing monitoring of a population that is now gone, extirpated from that site, and that you'll be get, beginning to think about um, revegetation at three years. Um, if you've applied your treatments appropriately, um, I think that's definitely achievable with the size of populations that we have in Minnesota. Yeah, and so obviously elimination is the goal, and as Julia said, is achievable with, we think, with many of our populations and with, you know, appropriate protocols for control. There, are, and additionally, you know, there are some larger populations in the state as well as in other states, and there can still be benefits of control that is short of full elimination. So particularly if you have, you know, high quality habitat that perhaps has species of concern in it, um, you can see benefit of reducing the abundance of pragmatis, even if it's short of fully eliminated. And um, when you presented some cost estimates for that control, um, did those include any replanting? And did you have any recommendations for the restoration half of that? The cost estimates include only uh, herbicide treatment and mowing costs. The cost of implementing those to control, actual control um, actions. Um, we, since we didn't know, um, there are, you know, kind of, it's site-specific site which sites will actually need revegetation or restoration. Um, so rather than assuming that in the cost estimates, we did not attempt to uh, estimate those costs. In the full report, we do go into more detail on this and note sites where we think revegetation or restoration may be more necessary based on the characteristics of the Phragmites population or of the site. Um, and so in some cases, you know, it may not be necessary. It may be a small enough patch and you can allow for recolonization of other vegetation. In other cases, active approaches are more likely to be needed. And there's some good research on that with Phragmites. There's a paper that just came out of Karin Kettenring's group at Utah State that um, addressed this issue of Phragmites patches of different size and sort of the, the fates of those after control. And that showed that it does depend on patch size. Okay. Um, then I have a couple of questions about the distribution of Phragmites in Minnesota. Um, so we have one person wondering if you agree about why the Minnesota sites tend to be so small. 
Um, it's likely that they're still small because it's a relatively new invasion in Minnesota. Um, there is some evidence that it's been here since the early 90s, um, and it was started to be used in some of the treatment plants in the mid 90s. Um, and relative to other states, I think those are it's a pretty pretty new um, invasion. So the populations are therefore smaller. Yeah, and it, you know it's a really common phenomenon in biological invasions in general to have a lag phase where there's sort of a period often multiple decades of buildup before there's kind of an inflection point and the species is able to take off. And I think we can look to nearby areas in the upper Midwest, you know, our neighbors to the east in Wisconsin. I used to uh, work out of the Chicago area and did research on Phragmites in southern Lake Michigan. Um, and people who had worked in those areas over a period of time and natural resources described, you know, seeing this change on the landscape over the course of their careers, you know, over a 15 or 20 year period, just really seeing an increase in abundance and population size. And so, um, yeah, I think that's why we think there's a real opportunity here because we can learn lessons from other states where that invasion is further along and we could look to them as um, a potential future of what Phragmites invasion might look like in Minnesota um, and can gain from what they've already learned through their research and through their management effort. Um, this development of you know best practices for control approaches, for example, comes from 40 years of management effort um, largely in the East Coast. Um, and so we can gain from that knowledge to keep the populations in Minnesota in check and hopefully even reverse the spread so that we don't get to the point where we see those um, you know, sort of really abundant and larger populations. I might add too that um, we may have, uh, because we have smaller populations, we may have less genetic diversity as well. And so some of those populations are not expanding because we don't have high viability, seed viability in some of those populations. And that may be playing into the, um, factoring into why we have smaller populations as well. Yeah, and disturbance could also be a factor, you know, particularly as you go further north in Minnesota, we have relatively more intact landscape. And so Phragmites, like many invasive plants, is really following human disturbance. Um, and so we might benefit from that as well. There has been research showing differences in native and non-native Phragmites in terms of response to global change, things like increases in nitrogen availability, carbon dioxide. And so we can expect non-native Phragmites to really be opportunistic under our future world that we're heading towards of being able to um, benefit from eutrophication and increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Great. Um, Julia, you mentioned a little bit about um, genetic diversity. So I'm gonna pop down to a question I saw about that, um, where we have someone wondering with the populations in Minnesota, um, if they're mostly from the same genetic variation or how different they might be, and if um, there's any evidence of um, different susceptibility to chemical control across those genetic variations. Um, I don't know actually about the second half of that question about um, susceptibility to chemical. I don't know if there's any papers about that to my knowledge. I haven't seen any. Yeah, yeah, if there are, I'm not aware of them, but they might be out there. Yeah. And then regarding just genetic, genetic diversity, we have sampled um, populations in Minnesota and our samples are actually still being processed. We hope to have those uh, by the end of our grant period, so within about a month. And then we'd be able to report back and we'll have some of that information up online on the website, but we don't know yet. Um, we don't have a good sense of the genetic variability we have in Minnesota at this time. Yeah, but that information is coming and we will be able to characterize genetic diversity both within populations as well as among populations across the state. Great. Um, so still then along the lines of distribution of Phragmites in Minnesota, um, about how many of the non-native Phragmites populations have been found within, you know, like close proximity, say about a mile to the wastewater treatment plants that are using those, or if you don't have, you know, within a mile, but in, in close proximity? Um, yeah, we it have. would be a small percentage of the populations that are within those, within boundaries or very close boundaries of the treatment plants. 
um, I would say that a, a stronger factor would be road size. So um, their, you know, the ability to move along those corridors, which are characterized by disturbance, um, is greater than what we're finding around treatment plants. We certainly are finding it around treatment plants, but um, there are other stronger correlations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't looked at, you know, exactly that, like any sort of distance, like We actually have numerically. Drawn, we have drawn a uh, buffer around those, and so I, I could actually pull that number up, but off the top of my head, I don't sure. know the number. But we do have um, a mile buffer around the treatment plants. You, you can go to the, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can go to the, the map, the distribution map on the MinFrag website, and you can see kind of where the wild populations are in proximity to the wastewater treatment facilities. Um, yeah. Yeah, the website has a Google Earth embedded in it, and as Chelsea said, you can click on the locations of the wastewater treatment facilities with non-native pragmatis, and you can, as you zoom in on some of those, as Julia described, there are certainly a number of them where you there are wild populations in close proximity. In northern Wisconsin, they actually did genetic sourcing um, to trace wild populations to wastewater treatment facilities and we're able to document that um, but I don't think that, that's, that they were related, right? that they were yeah. related um, to the wastewater treatment populations I don't think it's really that critical that we do that type of sourcing here I mean we know that there are a variety of means of spread and that it's already established in the state and we think what's needed now is sort of a multifaceted approach of addressing those di different risk factors Great. Um, so I have a question about the listing of Phragmites. So knowing that it's currently on MDA's noxious weed list, but not in the eradicator control groups, um, do you have a recommendation to the noxious weed advisory committee to move common reed into either that control or eradicate group? Yeah, so we, um, we've presented to the noxious weed advisory Committee. Um, and we also sent a uh, sort of a letter in to um, suggest that its classification be revisited. I'm far from an expert in the listing status. Um, I think the highest tier, the eradicate, I think tends to be reserved for species that are not really established in this state. Um, that have maybe occurred like um, Palmer amaranth, but are not where there are few, if any, populations. And so it would depend on sort of the the nature of law and statute where was most appropriate. But we think a change to either of those would um, provide increased support and incentive for control efforts. Yeah, and there's kind of some interesting history around the listing. Um, where the last risk assessment for invasive Phragmites that resulted in it being listed and restricted, um, a lot of that reasoning um, was due to not knowing a lot about the distribution of Phragmites in the state. Um, so now that we have better information about that, um, that can kind of be reevaluated. Yeah, that was one of our main a major motivation for this project overall was to address some of those knowledge gaps and uncertainties that were identified in 2016, the last time it was assessed through this process. Um, so I have some questions about treatment timing and what are your recommendations or thoughts in relation to that? So, and in particular, during the summer months like July and August, do those tend to be more effective when it's at that more manageable height? No, it should be treated the end of August into September, and it can be treated all the way up close to when it's going to frost off. Um, so mostly through September. Our typical frost the last couple of years, our first frost, our hard frost was October 10-ish. Um, so generally all the way through September is an appropriate time to spray. Um, July is not an appropriate time because at that time the plant is still actively growing and it's not sending resources down into its roots and you want to have the chemical transported from the leaf tissues down into the rhizomes um, where it can be active and kill the rhizomes. 
Great. And then um, we have a question, a couple questions about hybridization and um, having seen some reports of that. Is that something that we've seen in Minnesota? Do you have any evidence of through your genetic testing? Yeah, at this point, so we're still awaiting the finer resolution genetic results that would allow us to identify potential hybrids. In past research, um, sort of throughout the Midwest that I've been involved in, we analyzed about 500 plants um, and found no evidence of hybridization. That said, hybridization does occur. It's been documented in the literature, both in the greenhouse being done experimentally, as well as identification of wild hybrids. So there's, that's a real area um, of need for increasing knowledge. Um, one possibility is that molecular tools that have been used traditionally to look for hybrids may be have low power to detect hybridization. So it's possible that we're sort of missing um, greater prevalence of hybrids, hybridization that could be out there. There's also been relatively little search effort in places like Minnesota where there's still, where there's basically a lot of native Phragmites still left. So, um, you know, places like Chesapeake Bay or Southern New England, there's, um, Native Phragmites is now scarce, so you might be just unlikely to have hybridization. So in the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes region, that's really been identified as an area where more search for hybrids needs to be done, um, as that's where it's you know most likely to occur. But the so hybridization can happen. It would certainly be a complicating factor. Um, that said, despite the fact that it's you know different lineages of the same species, hybrids to, are rare to date, documented hybrids are rare to date. So, but again, whether that's a methodological limitation, search effort limit, limitation, or an underlying genetic or biological reason. I would add the biological reason, um, just based on my observations in the field, um, the timing of flowering is off for the two of them. So the native one seems to be done flowering before the invasive Phragmites begins flowering. So there may be some uh, particular ecotypes that um, overlap more, but in large part, it seems like they don't overlap in their flowering time in Minnesota, from, based on my observations over the last couple of years. Okay. And I think this will have to be the last question, but there's a quick follow-up. Um, Juliet here comments about mowing and um, why, why the first mow in January or February as opposed to during the growing season to reduce bigger and height prior to the fall spray? Um, you could mow in summer, but accessibility for some of the populations will be difficult because the ground is soft and wet because it's a wetland plant. Um, so, but there are some sites where that would be possible. But mowing in winter um, allows you to mow on frozen ground. So that would be one reason to do it. And, and then also because of risk to potential nesting birds as well, breeding birds. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I know that there are still a number of questions that have been asked that are not answered. So as we mentioned before, we'll be sure to capture those questions and um, try to get some answers available um, to those of you who we weren't able to get to your questions to. Um, we want to thank everyone for taking their time to join us at the webinar today. Um, as a reminder, you can view the assessment that the group has been referring to throughout the webinar at minfrag.org. Um, you can download the PDF there. Um, and there should be one more slide coming up with contact information for the group if you'd like to um, contact any of them directly. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you everybody for joining us.